and they all tell the story, which is a Jew story. I'm 17 years old, and my dad's a cop, remember, okay. My dad went to some kind of police convention, LAPD, and he wasn't supposed to be back till the Monday. So on the Sunday, we had a party at, at my house, and uh, the, um, I drank so much that they thought I, uh, I was dead. They pronounced me dead. Okay, about the same time that 999 guys are pronouncing me dead, my dad rolls up a day early, okay, uh, and uh, everybody scatters because my dad was a badass, and uh, <laughs> so uh, the, uh, they're saying that uh, we're afraid that you came just at the wrong time, sir, uh, uh, your son's away. He kicks me in the ribs, I sit up, <laughs> he says, I know the lazy fucking, <laughs> you know, get up, get to your room, I'll deal with you later. I'm from East Los Angeles. Um, I was born at the end of World War II in uh, Florida on a naval base. My dad was in the Naval Air Force. We moved to uh, East Los Angeles, where he was from and where my mother was from. And so I was in the barrio. And so I uh, got in a lot of trouble. Uh, the uh, uh, tried to kill my teacher when I was in fifth, sixth grade. Uh, expelled from uh, school three times and finally expelled from the school district. They wouldn't even take me in the district. They said, you gotta move. And, uh, the, um, and so my mother uh, uh, nagged my father into buying a house we couldn't afford uh, in an area that was considered um, safer. But I found bad shit to do there. I mean, you know, try to burn the school down amongst other things. <laughs> How'd you do? <laughs> yeah, well, no, I wasn't very successful. I'm not a good arson. <laughs> yeah, so that was one thing I ticked off not to try as I, I, when I grew up. Uh, and the um, the uh, and I volunteered uh, for the draft in 1966, at the height of the Vietnam conflict. And the um, and I went off, and the military made made, made a man out of me. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be picked to go to uh, officer school. And I spent six months there, and I came out, and so I was a young 21 year old second lieutenant, and the, and the world really changed for me. And that was the first high performance thing I had ever done, uh, where I was a commissioned an officer. And in American service, and in, here at the, in Britain, you're considered an officer and a gentleman. Now, I've been called a lot of things in my life, but a gentleman was not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I really took it seriously. And the, um, when, I, when I got out of the military, uh, I decided, uh, not that college education is a necessity, I decided to go back to university. I had flunked out three times before I left. I had been arrested five times, been in jail. Uh, the, um, but I came back, graduated, and then I, I, I went to Wall Street, where the action was in, the, in, in those days, which was the early 70s. And um, the rest is more or less history. I found it uh, invigorating, challenging every day. I used to work four or five days straight without going back to my apartment on, in Manhattan. Uh, and uh, I'm not too different now. Well, you had commented at the beginning of the interview how I'm, uh, I'm still after it uh, at my age. And I don't know any different. I still work 50, 60 hours a week, uh, but I don't consider it work because I love what I do. But back in those days, when I was your age, I worked 100 to 120 hours a week. I worked 12, 15, 18 hours a day. I slept on the floor of my office. Uh, or I slept on my desk, and the um, but uh, the uh, and then um, I, I founded a, a company uh, with 800 bucks, which is about nothing, uh, and I floated it here on the London Stock Exchange, um, and uh, I turned so I turned 820 bucks into 450 million bucks about 35 years ago, and today's dollars it'd be a, about a billion dollars, and that's pre-internet money, that's um, bricks and mortar. And uh, the, um, I got thrown out of uh, the company I founded uh, by the shareholders because I wasn't the right kind of guy to be uh, CEO of a public company. Uh, I owned 60% of the stock, so I didn't really give a fuck what the shareholders said. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> so you were in control. Yeah, I was in control. And as soon as I lost control, I was out. How can you lose control? Oh, well, because I sold stock off. You know, I bought places like this. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to have five big estates. And so, you know, I sold shares off at the appropriate time. Uh, and uh, ultimately, I went down below 50%. And uh, as soon as I uh, went down uh, below 50%, the shareholders ousted me. And the, uh, that was about 27 years ago. And about 26 years ago, I, I uh, trying to figure, what the fuck am I going to do, you know? 
-huh. I was still relatively young. I was in my late 40s. And uh, I decided, well, um, I'll coach. I'll see what I can show these kids how I did it. A kid from a bad neighborhood, got in trouble, went to jail, uh, expelled from school, all these bad things, flunked, uh, you know, uh, flunked out of university. Uh, and uh, I've been doing it uh, ever since. And when I started in um, uh, May of 1993, I said um, I didn't like the idea of personal development because personal development is, is not what I do. I wanted to change the way uh, financial coaching was and where we actually were accountable. How much money did I get you to create from scratch? How much money did I get him to create from scratch? And uh, so we set up a lot of very hard, stringent benchmarks. And 25 years later, I'm an overnight success after 25 years, mm. we created way in excess of $50 billion with meatheads just like you, mm. you know? Uh, just, you know, uh, whether you have no education or a lot of education. And um, the system is uh, renowned now. Uh, we have the processes, the systems, the procedures that allow somebody with no education, nay money, uh, to go out and create wealth. You had to be tough where I was raised. The, the, there was no soft people. Uh, everybody was a hard ass. And if you weren't a hard ass, you got the shit thumped out of you every day. Uh, but the, the rebel part, I've always had high self-esteem. I didn't realize growing up that most people don't have self-esteem. I thought everybody did because my little group where my alpha male father had a lot of self-esteem. He was a war hero from the Second World War and the Korean War. And uh, the, uh, he had a lot of self-esteem. And the guys that he was around had a lot of self-esteem. And so I took advantage of that self-esteem. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it was in, in, in a legitimate way. When one guy has self-esteem and 15 don't, it's very easy for that one guy to control the 15. Mm -hmm. And uh, I utilize that in the financial world, and in, I, I've been utilizing that, and now I teach the kids how to build self-esteem. Uh, low self-esteem isn't a permanent thing. It's like drug, a drug habit. You can get rid of it. It's not, it's not easy. In fact, it's very, very difficult to get rid of it, but you can, and so the, uh, but self-esteem is, is, is the basis of all high performance. And when you look around people like, jo like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, uh, they all have, have, have a lot of self-esteem, but what they also have, 98% of the people that are watching this, listening to this, uh, fall into one category. They're not alpha males, okay? They're beta males or beta gals. 98% uh, of the high-performance people in the world are not loudmouth fucks like you and me, okay? They're introverts, and Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett uh, are, have one thing in common. They're introverts. They're introverts that are super smart, and they're introverts that work 100, 120 hours uh, a week. Look at Warren Buffett, he's 88 years old, I believe. He still works 70, 80 hours a week at 88. He hasn't had to work in 40 years, 50 years. I haven't had to work in 35 years. Uh, some of the kids, uh, when I spoke at University of Edinburgh uh, about a year ago uh, to their uh, business school, the, um, a couple of the guys uh, and gals asked me, how do you get up in the morning when you haven't had to work in 35 years? How do you structure your day? Well, I don't think about the fact that I haven't had to work in 35 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I, all I know is I continue to reset my goals, reset my goals higher and higher. I continue to make the benchmarks higher and higher, and I make myself accountable. Nobody can make you accountable better than you. And, uh, the, um, and so I, I, I just continue to drive myself. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, okay? The, the, the medium mouth that sits in the corner reading a book it doesn't get much attention, okay? The wallflower girl, Lassie, doesn't get much attention. The, uh, the, uh, and so I learned that uh, the, the more I open my mouth, I've refined my, 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 uh, my ability to talk and speak over the years. When I was a young guy, I, you know, I was just pushy, obnoxious. Now they call me, uh, I'm uh, not pushy, obnoxious. I'm still pushy, but not obnoxious. It's hard to call somebody uh, with as much money as I have obnoxious. Mm -hmm. So they just say I'm pushy. But uh, I, I, don't, I almost will never take no for an answer. I don't care. My, 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 my re reply to you, if you say no to me, that's something I've requested. How can I make it so it's a yes? What can I change about the proposal? What about the structure? Uh, and uh, the, I, I normally turn half of the no's into yeses because normally it's something you said, you did. It's not like uh, the um, uh, Glasgow football. 
the Rangers versus the uh, Celtics. Celtics. It's it's not that kind of thing. It's not ingrained that they were raised to say no to you. Okay, um, the uh, they said no based on you didn't tick one of the boxes, and so when you learn to push the right buttons, as my Yorkshire wife would say, <laughs> uh, to push the right buttons, uh, you know how to narrow it down to, uh, to turn some of those no's into yeses. The first uh, seven or eight years of life is self-esteem is built. Who are you around the first seven or eight years? Your mom, maybe a dad, an older brother or sister, right? And maybe a grandparent. You can't do anything. You can't do anything about those, mm -hmm. okay? And what do those three or four or five people know about building self-esteem or building a high-performance person? Nothing. Fuck all. Okay. <laughs> now, you're, you're now 15 years old. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You're the average of the five to seven people that you hang with, chill with, your mates you go out to the fucking pub with. Okay? Most of the people that are listening to this, those mates are fucking bums. <laughs> okay? They don't deserve to be alive. They should have rolled down the inside of their mama's leg. <laughs> Fuck them. <laughs> so the easiest way to change, and I had a, a criminal, a uh, very well-known criminal, which I won't say his name. Not the one you interviewed, another one, though. Okay? I'll get him on the show next time. <laughs> okay. okay. And he was here in the late 90s, and he... Um, uh, and I told him the easiest way. In those days, we had block phones that looked like this, cell phones that looked like this, you know, block, bricks. And I, I told him, I said, when you go back uh, to London, uh, change the phone number and say in the message, if you don't have my uh, phone number, fuck off, you're out of my life. A year or two later, I, I bump into him in London at a, at a restaurant. And I said, how does it go? And he says, it's going terrific. And that idea you about changing the phone number was great until my mother got the message. Okay, <laughs> and I mean, uh, the, most of the people uh, that we attract people, you know, the, the law of self-attraction is, you know, they're talking about positive attraction, but it also works in a negative way. Most of the people that we are uh, associating with remind us of ourselves. They don't remind us of some yeah. world-class Olympian, or they don't remind us of, you know, um, uh, uh, Andrew Carnegie, who just comes from down the road here, yeah, yeah. arguably the richest guy who ever America. lived. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he left, uh, mm -hmm. depending on which story you want to believe, either between seven and 12 years old. Um, but uh, they leave that environment. And so, but it's very difficult for you to close down Facebook, take all the phone numbers in your, well, they don't call them Rolodex anymore, but whatever your, yeah. your iPad or whatever it is, uh, and sw switch them out. And one of the things, and the kids that are the most successful, and the reason why I'm more successful uh, in many regards with young kids they don't have as much negative baggage. Uh, you know, uh, my current uh, phenom, who's not a teenager anymore, he's 21, uh, Josh Kim, uh, you know, uh, didn't have a lot of negative baggage because he was only 17 years old uh, when he came here. Uh, well, the guys that are 45, 50, 55 have been through a lot of shite, and it's difficult for them. First of all, they've got mortgages to pay, car payments, perhaps uh, school payments, uh, a school for their kids to go into, if they go to a private school. Uh, they've got uh, to support a mom, mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe a drunken dad, uh, a drug addict brother, okay? It's very difficult. I'm not suggesting they do that. Just cut them all off. <laughs> Eagles fly alone. Yeah. Okay? Uh, Eagles fly above the clouds. All the other dipshit birds fly in the clouds, okay? <laughs> Pigeons. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so, but Eagles fly alone. Uh, Warren Buffett, Elon Musk, uh, those kind of people don't hang. They don't chill. They don't go to the World Cup. They, 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 they don't go to the, uh, uh, the uh, World Basketball Championships. They don't go to the Masters. They don't go to the Open Championship. They don't go any fucking place. Mm -hmm. All they do is work. And uh, the, uh, uh, the only friend uh, possibly that um, uh, uh, Bill Gates has is Warren Buffett, his mentor, mm -hmm. okay? The, um, and th I, I understand I've got three guys. I used to have five guys, two are dead now. I have three guys that I've known since I was a boy. We're all poor and uh, we're all successful. I'm the most successful. Uh, we see each other once or twice a year. We have a dinner, uh, we talk about the old times, uh, and then I'll, I'll see you next year. That's it. Uh, and they all tell the story, which is a true story. I'm 17 years old and my dad's a cop, remember, okay. My dad went to some kind of police convention, LAPD, and he wasn't supposed to be back till the Monday. So on the Sunday, we had a party at, at my house and uh, the, um, I drank so much that they thought I, I, I was dead. They pronounced me dead. 
Okay. About the same time that 999 guys are pronouncing me dead, my dad rolls up a day early. Okay. Uh, and uh, everybody scatters because my dad was a badass. And uh, <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the saying that uh, we're afraid that you came just at the wrong time, sir, uh, uh, your son's away. He kicks me in the fucking ribs. I sit up. <laughs> he says, I know the lazy fucking, th you know, get up, get your room. I'll deal with you later. Mm -hmm. you know, he didn't give a shit. I almost died. All I know <laughs> is that we had trashed the house, drank all the alcohol that was in the house. Uh, and the uh, and he was embarrassed. The neighbors. He went around and apologized to all the neighbors, because when you fuck something up in, in, in a bad neighborhood, they look down upon. They say, I apologize. I apologize. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take care of Danny. Don't worry. I'm going to take care of him. And when my dad was extremely hard on me, uh, and uh, when his brother and sister, older brother and sister, said, "You know, you're really rough on Danny," because uh, he used to beat me like I mean, physically beat me like a rented mule. And he turned to his sister and say, "Well, how's your program working out with your crack whore daughter?" And he turned to his brother and said, how's your program working out with your San Quentin, that's a prison, San Quentin ridden son? Mm -hmm. You leave me running my family. And of course, then, you know, uh, I was, the other of my relatives weren't successful. I have a cousin who went to jail for stabbing a guy 17 times for saying his girlfriend had a big ass. Stabbed him 17 times. <laughs> By the grace of God, he didn't know how to stab because the guy didn't die. <laughs> you know? Do you think that helped you, though? Oh, yeah. Your I saw dad that. beating the shit out of you to, oh, yeah. to become uh, ruthless. Absolutely, yeah. My dad believed children are seen and not heard. Seen. And when I, my dad told me to stand right there, short of a tsunami, knocking me down, I didn't move. Mm -hmm. One day, three days, four months, I didn't move because he'd beat the fuck out of me. Uh, my dad, I believe, invented tough love in the 50s, and he probably didn't. But I mean, the tough love, I was hard. And the, um, uh, and especially uh, now, uh, we have kids that come to the seminar here that have never been in a schoolyard fight, have never been uh, disciplined by their parents, uh, I mean, spanked or hit, never uh, yelled at by their parents, uh, never, uh, they wouldn't say shit if it was in their mouth, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I come, I come up with the phrase snowflake, because they melt under pressure, <laughs> you know? Okay, uh, we have a snowflake test. If uh, somebody uh, spit in your mother's face, you have four alternatives. Mm -hmm. The most used alternative on that test, as God is my witness, I would try to ascertain what kind of day he was having, the guy that spit in your mom's face, instead of picking up a fucking pipe <laughs> and leaving his brains on the fucking sidewalk. That's true. In my neighborhood, the spit wouldn't have even hit their mom's mm -hmm. face before the guy would be on him. Kids have been uh, convinced wrongly, in my opinion, that reading books and listening to podcasts and, and, and uh, researching stuff on the internet is taking action. That's not taking action. Fucking pulling the trigger and doing it trial and error, just as you alluded to a minute ago. It's trial and error. Most of the stuff I, I know is because I've been involved uh, in, uh, in every kind of uh, happening possible. Uh, I, when I spoke at Oxford a couple years ago, one of the guys in the front row said, do you realize that I've, uh, uh, I've read 700 books on personal development? And I commented, well, I didn't know there was 700 books on personal development. Mm -hmm. Then a guy that was sitting two, two spaces over said, uh, who would you rather have? Somebody that uh, advising you, uh, counseling you, mentoring you, a person that has read 700 books or a person that has done 700 transactions. Well, I've done many more than 700 transactions, but I mean, I want the person that's got some gray hair, bald head, wrinkles, that has lived life advising me, not some guy that's some academic that has read 700 books. The kids today find uh, reasons or they find things to do to really procrastinate to not, not take action. <clears throat> it's, uh, but you gotta love you got to have a passion for what you do. If you don't, you know, um, it, it gets tired. Alistair Cook, the great presenter, BBC presenter, told me about, I don't know, 30, 35 years ago, being a professional, being a high-performance professional is being able to do your very best when you don't feel like it. Mm -hmm. Okay? When you don't. Okay. And, uh, and, and I've had days, not every day uh, do I, I want to speak uh, when I'm at the university, the Oxford University, Edinburgh, whatever, but they don't know it. As far as they're concerned, I look like, you know, I was, I was born for that night. Yeah. And, I, the, uh, and so, but I was taught 
high performance people don't leave anything on the stage. Yeah. Yeah, in athletic uh, endeavors, I never left anything on on uh, on the field. In uh, public speaking, uh, I don't leave anything on the stage. I'm fully spent yeah, in each day. The high performance people that we've alluded to so far during this interview don't hang out, don't go to the Super Bowl, uh, 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 they work 15, 18 hour days, uh, have no friends. I mean, what does it take? A sledgehammer to hit the kid in the head to understand that they're doing the antithesis of that. They're doing the ab ab absolute opposite of that. And that's why their results are, are you know, are de minimis. They're, they're, they're not worth a, uh, a shit. And, uh, but the kids today, the, uh, uh, and what I believe the political correctness movement, which is a manifestation of lack of self-esteem. It's hard to find anybody with self-esteem. And it's doubly hard to find somebody with self-esteem that's got some balls. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's pretty, uh, well, uh, next to impossible. One of the reasons we started boxing at the seminars uh, <laughs> is that uh, some of the kids had never been hit. Some of the kids had never been slapped. Uh, and so the, uh, to see the fear in their eyes when they get ready to get up in the ring, it's quite remarkable. Uh, it, it's hard for me to believe that uh, you can be uh, 35 years old and never been in one confrontation in your whole fucking life. But we've had some, you know, we've had people knocked out. We've had to call uh, uh, 999 a couple of times. <laughs> uh, the, a lot of blood on the uh, floor of the ring. And my goddamn uh, staff uh, scrubbed it all up. Uh -huh. I want to see the fucking blood. I don't want it scrubbed <laughs> up. God damn it. <laughs> how, how does that help them? Progress it helps them because, it because them? when they're going to call on the, uh, the former chairman of the Royal Bank of Scotland, that's not hard. Getting punched in the fucking face is hard. Uh -huh. And if they can get punched in the face and call on the fucking Royal Bank of Scotland. Becomes easier. Correct. So, yeah, to toughen up, basically. And you have to be selfish. Yeah. No, you, you can't love anybody else. You can't be a good father, good uh, son, good uh, whatever, unless you love yourself first. You take care of yourself first, mm -hmm. uh, both physically and mentally, then you can take care of other yeah. people.